This week on CrossFeed. Catholics and vouchers. Southern Baptists and a black president. Baptists debating the sinner's prayer. Church ladies and exotic dancers. is dance special? Yes, Mormons and Christians. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. It's good to be back. Um, hopefully, well, actually, I'm going to make it a couple weeks in a row this time. Um, although, I haven't seen a new one up from Dale, so he's behind on the I editing. I posted it so. last night. Did you? Okay. Yeah, good. you're just not paying attention. I, well, I didn't see it on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, it was like... Oh, 12.30 in the morning or something like that. Oh, okay. Um, no, I wouldn't have been around at that yeah, time. We, yeah, we should probably like give dates for these. Like, we're recording this on the 24th, because the problem is, is a lot of times um, they just get delayed and, and stuff like that. So, uh, so you know, anything that we say has to be sort of prefaced, um, keeping in mind, because the last one you said, you know, no episode for two weeks, and, you know, people are going to, you know, well, no, actually, it's been a while, and then um, there'll be a couple right in a row or something like that. So, yeah. So this is yeah June twenty fourth that we're doing this. So last Sunday in June next month, next week will be in the month of July. Yep. Hard to believe we're already there. So last weekend we both had our um, our district conventions, and uh, Jim is. No longer the district secretary. How long were you district secretary of the New England district? 18 years. Wow. That's longer than I've been a pastor. You're old. Okay. I know. <laughs> Here's the wild thing. And the whole time I've been in New England, I've never been in a convention where I was not taking the minutes. <laughs> Wait. I've, how'd you get elected before you were... Well, I was nominated... And I thought they were nominating me because somebody had to lose. And um, so the previous secretary called me and he said, hey, the second day of the convention, which is the only day I could make it because I was working on my doctorate at the time. So I could make it the first day. I could only go down Saturday. And so he called me up and he says, uh, I got a wedding on Saturday. So would you mind going ahead and taking the minutes? I'm like, no, not a problem. Sure, I'll be glad to do it. So I went down and started taking the minutes. Well, I got to the election of secretary. Come to find out, my name was the only name on the ballot. <laughs> you were set up. <laughs> so, yeah, I, so I've never been in the so – I've always taken the minutes in this district and every convention that I've ever attended. Huh. And, uh, and say, I mean, when I was nominated, only in the district two years, I didn't think anybody knew – have any idea who I was or – you know, and I figured the guy who had the job was, you know, going to be reelected. Well, what I didn't know was that he was nominated as a vice president, and he was elected vice president the night before. Uh. So that was the end of that whole thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I stepped aside. However, um, they did elect me to the board of directors. So there were – which was pretty cool because there were six pastors who were nominated to the board of directors, <laughs> and I was – I got a majority on the first ballot, and I was the only one who did. Cool. So. So just, you know, switching hats. Yeah, a little bit. I'll still be on the board, but I don't have to take any more minutes. So I can actually just kind of sit back and pay attention to what's going on and get <laughs> the debate. And go over the minutes to the guy and say, you misspelled this word in the sentence. <laughs> you know. And everything else. Also, I suppose district secretary, you don't really get to, you know, go up to the microphone and complain. Uh, actually, except for a couple resolutions, no, nobody went to the microphones at our convention. Really? Really? It was can quiet. I, can I send you a couple of ours? <laughs> no. Um, this was this was a very quiet convention. Um, Oh, there's only one resolution where anybody tried to make an amendment or or anything, and oh man, 
I got to type. All right, ours. We had uh, one to encourage uh, uh, new pastors to use the PALS program, yep. right, which for those um, who don't know, uh, it's it's uh, I don't remember what it stands for. But it's a it's a mentoring it, system for when you first come out of seminary. Yeah, for new pastors, all right. Yep. And <clears throat> um, it was it was pretty new when I started out. It was there, but it was only a couple years old. Uh, we only met once the whole time. Uh, but it was kind of cool that uh, uh, Wally Schultz just happened to be in the area, and he stopped in and just sat around and chatted with us and um, gleaned some good information from him. But it all walk um, on water, Wally. Yeah. So. Um, but anyway, it was so it was just to encourage guys to use it. All right, I think we spent. I mean, this is what I'd call a throwaway. Um, you yeah. know, you you just everybody goes, yeah, yeah, sounds good. You know, boom, done. All right, no. So somebody amended it to exhort instead of encourage, because we want to, you know, really strongly encourage them. So it, so that amendment passed. And I mean, there's like all this debate about a throwaway amendment. And, right. And <laughs> and the, I mean, the whole thing was just ridiculous. It was just like, come on, let's move along, you know. Right. And and then there was a couple more throwaway ones. The committee didn't just accept that as a friendly amendment and let's just move on. I was like, then we had one on uh, encouraging parents to. You know, bring their children, teach their kids about Jesus or something like that. Well, that one didn't pass. Um, the argument was, well, this is just part of standard Christian living. Um, and and so we don't need a a resolution to say that. But I'm going, okay. But if we reject the resolution, what is that saying? <laughs> you know. I don't know. <laughs> hey, but you know what? We weren't the only people in convention. The Southern Baptists were in convention, and they did a couple of really interesting things. So let's start with the Southern Baptists today. All right. Which one do you want to uh, Speaking of weird things to sit there and debate, they debated, of all things, the sinner's prayer. This was kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Kind of- now, if you know anything about Southern Baptists, you know um, – this is uh, they, – they've been kind of taken over for years by an Armenian theology, and, you know, you have the altar call, you know, and every eye is – you know, bowed, head is bowed, and every eye is closed, and you raise your hand, and you want to accept Jesus, and you come up and you say the sinner's prayer. Well, it's interesting. One of the things that's happening is that a lot of Southern Baptists are becoming disciples of John Piper, and Piper is a pretty avowed – is an avowed Calvinist. And so they're get, there's getting to be a lot of Calvinists showing up now in the Southern Baptist Convention. Calvinism is really growing. I mean, it's a, there's a lot of what they call the the new Calvinists. Yes, the new Calvinists, and a lot of it's coming out of John Piper, mm-hmm. uh, and probably a little bit out of Tim Keller as well, because he's yep. Presbyterian. Mm-hmm. Uh, and anyway, so this is uh, so they had a uh, um, resolution. Actually, it wound up being a resolution to um, support the sinner's prayer. Um, and it passed, but not without a lot of debate. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with the sinner's prayer, just grab a Gideon Bible, um, and and you'll find it in there, in the right. in the back, I think. Um, if you don't have a Gideon Bible, stay in a hotel. <laughs> You'll find one. Um, but, uh, and, you know, okay, so here's the thing on the sinner's prayer. Uh, there's no biblical precedent for it. Um, you know, you can look at passages like uh, if you confess uh, with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. All right. And so they say, well, you're, you're confessing. And, you know, and, and, and so they, they've got their sort of proof text to back it up. Um, and really, the question isn't really so much about the, the sinner's prayer, but um, over the the will of the human being. All right, so that's your big difference between your Arminians and your uh, and your Calvinists and, and Lutherans. Of course, we sort of do a little bit of both. We, we're we're not fence sitters as much as we embrace both sides. <laughs> um, 
Well, in a sense, I mean, <clears throat> all right. So I don't think so. Well, no, no, no. They no, would no. say a pox on both your houses. No, well, okay. Let me let me explain that. All right. <clears throat> Do we believe um, that, like Calvinists, that we are totally depraved and and unable to um, to accept uh, faith that it, that is completely the work of God in our hearts? Yes, absolutely. Right? Do we believe like the Arminians that you're able to reject that faith uh, because of, of your sinful nature? Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, so Calvinists would say that you can't reject it, you um, or or accept it, and Arminians would say that you um, that that it's completely your choice, free will, one way or the other. Uh, Holy Spirit influences well, Ar- it. Armenians but, get very strange on that, actually, because they'll tell you you can't accept Jesus. What they'll say is the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and changes your heart so you can make the choice. Right. You know, almost some po- – actually, uh, there's an article. I don't know if I got the – if it was in this article or another one where they were talking uh, – the Southern Baptists were also talking about semi-Pelagianism. And I'm going, well – you know, has ever done on you people that the sinner's prayer is semi-Pelagian mm-hmm. because, right. you know, it's to get this idea that, you you know, get, God gets you started and then you've got to make the next step. Right. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> amazing some of the stuff because this came up because one of the uh, uh, Southern Baptist Calvinist star, a guy by the name of uh, David Platt, who was speaking at a church leaders conference in March and told them, uh, I'm convinced that many people in our churches are Missing the life of Christ and love it has to do with what we sold them as the gospel. Uh, that is, pray this prayer except Jesus in your heart. Should it not concern us, there is no such superstitious prayer in the New Testament. Ouch. All right. yep. That's, uh, wow. Should it not concern us that the Bible never uses the phrase except Jesus to your heart or invite Christ into your life? And, and he's right. I mean, there's, there is no place in, you know, and I can't remember, yeah, I, I, there's places in Acts, and I remember I, we did a Bible study, and I said, now here's the place, if, if, Paul, if somebody's going to say, except Jesus in your heart, this would be the place to do it. Yeah. Well, you but know, Paul doesn't say, except in Jesus in your heart, and... he says, believe in the Lord and you will be saved. Right. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, the um, the the jailer. Um, yeah. You know, and. Yeah, there's there's lots of places where you'd expect to see that if if that were the case. Um, to the contrary, you have places like Jesus saying, "You did not choose me; I chose you." Um, uh, John one talking about not human decision. Um, you know, there's just there's places all over the place that. Um, it, okay, so the whole problem with this is, um, it's this tension that that we as Lutherans hold that if you really sort of um, try to wrap your head around it. Uh, it's a bit of a logical inconsistency. All right, it doesn't quite work logically. No, you can't accept it, but you can reject it. Well, doesn't that mean if you don't reject it that you accept it? Nope, that's not what the Bible says. All right. So, and we just we we hold that intention, and we say, you know what? Um, God doesn't answer that question, and so we just we leave it to Him and and say. Um, you know, I'm not going to try and, and answer a question that God hasn't answered about himself and, um, you know, ask him when you get there. And, um, so really the, you know, the, the two sides to that coin uh, or fence or whatever metaphor you want to use, um, they're answering a question that the Bible doesn't answer. They're sort of, it, it you, you can go so far in one direction or the other, and they sort of take the next logical step in one direction or the other, and we don't. And at least that's the way we see it. Now what? Let's be reasonable. We can resolve our differences. Uh, you know, well, the other thing that to me, now the guy on the other side says the problem the new Calvinists have in his prayer is that they believe only certain people can come to faith. So they're arguing that there's a limited atonement, at least at these new Calvinists, that's, which is interesting because I, I, I've met very few Calvinists, modern Calvinists actually would go that far. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, New Calvinism is not exactly the same as, uh, it, but it depends on the New Calvinist too. Like, I listen to a lot of Mark Driscoll. He's a New Calvinist. Um, he's like spearheading a whole New Calvinist leadership thing and and all stuff. Um, and um, and he 
definitely holds to limited atonement, but he really de-emphasizes it. Um, you know, and, and he just says, you know what, it is my job to bring the gospel to people, and it's God's job to decide what happens. Well, I like, uh, there's a uh, evangelical from e- England, uh, Rico Tice, and he says, we, pre- uh, we preach Christ, God opened the blind eyes. End of story. And I thought, okay, that's about as evangelical and Lutheran as I could ask for, mm-hmm. you know. And I don't, I don't know where he stands on the be an interesting question. But, you know, he would just say, we preach Christ, God opened the blind eyes. End of story. <laughs> right. You know, and I think, you know, okay, I, I could say that. Right. You know, the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens through what? The preaching of the gospel. Uh but you're, you're listening to Calvinists. I've been wondering what's been going on with your theology. Now I know. I was in Tim um, Keller, too. That guy's a Tim genius. Kel- oh, man. Um, anyway, I'm not even going to go down that line. Anyway, the other big news at the Southern Baptist Convention was that they elected a black president. Now, this is absolutely historic because the Southern Baptist Convention was formed over to disagreement with the uh, Northerners on slavery. The Southern Baptist Convention was known for uh, its support, you know, members were known for their support of Jim Crow laws. And so, I mean, now they had 7,000, um, you know, delegates called messengers, and he's elected overwhelmingly pushed by the, the people kind of at the top of the denomination. And all 7,000 Southern Baptists leapt to their feet, cheered, and shouted. I mean, this is this is truly historic. It's great. Um, <clears throat> since then, by the way, since this issue of slavery, Northern, called the American Baptists and the Southern Baptists, have um, you know really separated theologically. Northern Baptists are pretty liberal, and Southern Baptists are much more conservative. But right. still, this is this. Uh, but now, this this is huge. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we need to make it clear here, and and this is, I mean, makes it obvious. But um, while that may have been their history um, over the slavery issues and, and things like that, um, it's not the case anymore. All right. No, but it took them a long time. It was not until 1995. That, um, you know, the Southern Baptist, you know, apologized for the deplorable sin of racism. I mean, it took them a long time to get to the point, just 150 years to say we were on the wrong side of history and we're sorry. Yeah. That doesn't we were mean on that the every, wrong side of scripture and we're sorry. It doesn't mean even that the majority of the people, it may have just took them that long to get around to it, you know. I, I've known plenty of Southern Baptists, and none of them were racist. So, but it took them, you know, it, it took them, you know, a, a long time. But that is that was part of the history. But that's part of why it is so huge that this mm. that this you know happened. Um, and it's uh, uh, just a really beautiful thing. Um, uh, this guy, he's fifty five. He's a former street preacher, and he had a uh, church in New Orleans which was uh, heavily damaged by Hurricane Katrina and pretty much brought that back from the dead. Uh, so he is just extremely uh, well done, uh, seemed to be a very, very good, uh, and has attracted a lot of um, black males to his congregation. So it's really a cool thing. That's great. Now, of course, you know, any time, and I, I think I mentioned this in the last episode, I'm always a little bit nervous about somebody being an elect, being elected to a position because of the color of his skin. Um, but I get the impression that that is not the case here, that that may have encouraged people to vote for him just to say, hey, we're not racist. Um, you know, it's sort of like in the Obama election, um, you know, he, a lot of people said that they voted for him because of the color of his skin, that that was... The, that was why that it had nothing to do with um with his position on any particular issues um and and i am really against voting for someone because of the color of their skin um that said i'm not saying that this guy is not worthy of the title 
uh, that he's not going to be a good president to them, and and uh, and I have no reason to think that he won't be. Right. Um, well, you know, I'll be honest. Okay, that I, you know, if I had two, if we had two people who were equally qualified to be president of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, one was white and one was an ethnic minority. I would vote in favor of the ethnic minority. So would I. You if know, they were I really all things being equal. Yeah, so would I. You know, I mean, but you know, why? Because I think that would be a very powerful statement. Mm-hmm. I like what this one guy said. He said, "We can't go back and redo the past, but we can show where we're going in the future." Yeah, we cannot undo our past, but we can show the world we're redoing our future. Yeah, I mean, you know, and and the thing is, this is an important issue. Because, uh, you may have heard this before, the church is still the most segre, or Sunday morning is the most segregated hour, um, of the week or something like that. Mm. Um, you know, the churches, you go anywhere in the country and you walk into a church and chances are, um, you're gonna see one, you can walk into Hispanic churches, you walk into Chinese churches, black churches, white churches, right? You don't mm. see much ethnic diversity. Um, our church does not have much, although I have to say that our church has more ethnic diversity than our town does. And I think that's good because we're but our on the other hand, officials like 98% white or something like that. I think there are some sociological reasons for that that aren't just necessarily, um, you know, black, white issues. I mean, Okay, so I'm up here in the Boston area, and there are Irish Catholic churches and Polish Catholic churches and, you know, other ethnic, you know, you know, Catholic churches. They're all Catholic. But, you know, there are some ethnic things that tie them together that go beyond the fact that they're white. I mean, it's the, you know, the food that they eat and stuff. I remember talking with one, um, black Lutheran and he said, you know, I wouldn't feel real comfortable going to some white Lutheran churches. We're a little bit louder than you guys are. Uh, there is a uh, – the largest church in the Atlantic District, I don't know if it's still, but at it, one time, was the Church of African Immigrants on Staten Island. And the service there goes for like two, two and a half hours. Hmm. Uh, a friend of mine was preaching there one time. Uh, he was a guest preacher. And they started doing all these these hymns and, and praise songs and stuff. And the um, pastor of the church comes over and grabs my friend, who's you know the guest preacher. He says, "Come on, let's go talk." He says, "What do you mean?" He goes, oh, "They'll be doing this for at least forty five minutes." Hmm. And I'll just one song after another. I'm now come on. I mean, I don't know about you. My people wouldn't feel real comfortable in a service like that. No, no. I, I've just, if, I've done you know services where. Uh, like we did a service one time where every element of the service uh, was replaced by a song, um, and uh, and and like people really loved it as a one-time thing. I mean, it was just you know people were using words like epic. It like it this was great, but but everyone was exhausted after an hour of it. <laughs> so I take it though, you know. You know, and they wouldn't like 45 minutes of just one song after another, but then that's what this place did every week. So, so I, I question sometimes when, we, when people do that. I mean, I do think back in the old church growth stuff, the homogeneous unit principle was, was to a certain extent, right? That people with a certain, you know, have certain, that people tend to, you know, birds of a feather tend to flock together. They just tend to like it, tend to attract like for a lot of, for a lot of different reasons, not just because of, uh, um, uh, uh, necessarily, uh, 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 black, white issues. Uh, let's see here. Uh, well, okay. We're talking about the Baptist and Richard Land is the Baptist, uh, guy, Baptist is a Baptist, um, guy. So let's go over and talk then about Mormons because Richard Land is quoted in the story. Um, that's my segue there, my connection. It's a pretty weak one, I'll grant you, but we have to go <laughs> a little bit. We got. <laughs> we got. So there's this this is from the New York Times. It was an op ed piece. I'm Mormon, not a Christian. Um 
And I'm going to tell you, I mean, this guy says, I am a temple goer with a Utah pedigree, administrative physician and congregation of the, of the LDS. I am also emphatically not Christian. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is, I, I don't know about you. I, first, I'm not sure what his definition by Christian is. Well, yeah, he uses it in a few different ways. Yeah, I mean, he really does. Um, first, it's it's a theological thing. You know, uh, that Christians don't, that Christians won't accept that Jesus, Christians won't accept Mormons as Christian, really. Um, because they don't agree with the Nicene Creed, although he doesn't seem to understand what the Nicene Creed says. No, because he says that Nicene Creed says that Jesus is the Father and the Holy Spirit. Which, right. That's modalism, and we rejected that, right. uh, over a thousand years ago. So. Right. Um, but then he goes, um, you know, uh, 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 being a Christian often involves so much such boorish and mean-spirited behavior that I marvel that any of my Mormon colleagues are so eager to join the fold. Yeah, he's sort of painting with a you know, real broad brush. Yeah. Um, eh, you know, that's an us-against-them kind of thing. It doesn't really surprise me. Um you know, I mean, yeah, and then later on, he he says, uh, um, "I hope that whatever happens in November, because he, um, well, he says um, maybe Mormon in the White House will hasten the moment when Mormonism will no longer plead uh, to be liked. Although, um, since Romney's painting himself as uh, a wasp, that's probably not the case." Um, but uh, he says, I hope Mormonism eventually realizes it doesn't need Christianity's approval and will get big and beat up um, and will get big and beat up all the imperious Christians who tormented it when it was small, weird, and painfully self-conscious. Mormons are certainly Christian enough to know how to spitefully abuse their power. And so I, and I think that that was probably intended as wordplay. Um and and so what he's saying there is that, or as I gather, is is that um, Mormons have learned a few things from Christians too. Um, right. Well, well, about how to be nasty and yeah. boorish and mean spirited. Right. Um, I mean, I just I saw this headline thought this is interesting. Here's this guy, you know, he's admitting that Christianity and Mormonism are two different things, but then I'm just trying to figure out what his his theology is. Basically, it's Christians are a bunch of mean-spirited, nasty people, uh, and we know uh, we're really not. We're really good people. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is it's, – it's sort of like – you know, I remember when I was in eighth grade and, and I was trying to fit in with um, with the popular crowd and, and failing miserably at it. And then somewhere along – somewhere that year, I realized that I was trying to befriend people that I didn't want to be friends with, uh, that I didn't like. And and it appears that in a um, in a religious sense he's gotten to that point um, that oh you know Mormons are going around trying to paint themselves as Christians and, um, and and trying to get Christians to like them and and stop uh, trying to evangelize Mormons and you know and all that kind of stuff and hey can't we all just get along which you know at least most Christians perceive from Mormons as um, yeah. That's uh, because you guys define terms differently than we do, um, and you know, painting yourself that way is really uh, not very uh, honest about what you really believe. Um, and since I've been on the receiving end of the missionaries when I was in high school, um, I I've experienced that firsthand, where you say, "Well, you know," I remember saying, "Do you believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit?" Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but they didn't say, yeah, but we should probably explain to you what we actually believe that that means that's very different from you, you know, and, you know, and things like that where they weren't real upfront and honest with me about what I believed. And when I asked my Mormon friend, well, what do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? She'd say, well, you're not ready for that yet. I'm not saying they all operate like that because I've also met Mormons, um, 
that were very upfront and open about what they believe. And, and when I told them about my experiences, they were shocked. So, you know, we have to be careful that we don't paint with broad brushes, um, the Mormons either. Um, but you know, I, but I do, I appreciated his comments, uh, even though, yeah, he really doesn't get the Trinity, but most Mormons I've known don't really understand the Trinity. Um, they understand what they've been told Christians believe about the Trinity. Um, and, uh, really would do themselves well to just sit down and read the Athanasian Creed sometime. Um, just to educate themselves. Um, but, uh, the, and, and I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, this guy, he's an associate professor of theater. Well, you know, man, I'll tell you what, I don't know what his theater teaching is like, but something like it's, it's really bad history. Um, you know, he says, uh, Christians grew up reading the Torah, living the law, observing the Sabbath, thinking themselves as Jews. They actually were. Um, they were aghast to find out the traditional Judaism regarded them as something else entirely. What? You mean after Jesus had to deal with the Pharisees, they were shocked that, you know, I mean, it's, you know, the, the, there is no question that Paul understood that Christianity and traditional Judaism were two completely different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, one was law and the other was gospel. Right. Um, and while they, you know. they saw, you know, early Christians, uh, rightly saw themselves as the, um, as, as the rightful successors, um, they also recognized that traditional Judaism, uh, as, as in, uh, Pharisaic Judaism, as well as, um, you know, the equivalent of, of modern Orthodox Judaism, um, right. is, had strayed from, uh, from the faith of the Old Testament. And then it said that, uh, you know, eventually Christianity grew up and conceded it wasn't authentic Judaism. Well, they had already done that. Um, and then it became a state religion and spent the next 1700 years getting back at all the bullies who slighted it when it was a child. I, I'm like, what are you talking about? I know, because I'm like, what did, those two things have nothing to do with each other. It became a state religion because of, of Constantine, not... And right. <laughs> yeah, Constantine and then later, well, really, Theodosian. Yeah. Uh, who was the one who actually made it the state religion of Rome. And, you know, well, you know, and, 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 and a lot of these people were, I mean, the Roman Empire fell. And there was a thing called a power vacuum. And the only institution left standing was the church. So, of course, everybody kind of looked at the church... You know, for leadership or something. I mean, you know, because there was nothing else. Right. So and yeah, it has I don't to think do with... you know. And I'm okay. Um, and I don't know. Again, Theodosian was in the year 380. In 1700 years, we're in the year 2080. <laughs> he's rounding. <laughs> I, I, he's. I mean, really rounding. You know, if you're rounding, then you know. Why say 1,700, but not 1,500? There you might be a little bit closer. I mean, it's just, I don't know. Um, okay, well, let's talk about how these boorish, mean-spirited, hateful, nasty people uh, act that he doesn't want to be part of with the little church ladies dealing with the exotic dancers. Here's, good, here yeah. we're going to see these... Mean spirited, nasty, boorish Christians at work. This uh this really resonated with me, this article, because I thought this is a beautiful story. Oh, it's awesome. But it was it, it actually answered a question that's that's been bugging me. Um because, Is it okay to go to gentlemen's clubs? <laughs> well though I was driving past one. And I was thinking about because I've been um any of my Facebook friends have seen um this and it's it's public, so anybody can go to my page and see it. Uh, I've had this really long, drawn out. I posted speaking of Mark Driscoll and the Calvinists. Um, I posted one of his sermons, and um, and it was about pornography, and and I ended up in this long, drawn out uh, debate about pornography uh, with three atheists. And uh, one of whom is a friend of mine, and the other two are friends of his. And that because my post was public, they sort of latched onto it, and um, and it was 
it was really hard because uh not that i find my um my understanding or position difficult to defend but because they were coming from such a completely different worldview than me it was hard to convey things in a way that that they would even understand where I was coming from. It's sort of like if you ever try to explain to somebody not who Jesus is, but what it's like to be a Christian and what it's like to live under the gospel, it's really hard because it's just like it's it's like trying to explain uh, the color blue to someone who was born blind. So anyway. It's kind of interesting. There used to there's a woman out in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and there's a woman by the name of Tammy Crane, and she used to drive by a local gentleman's club, Reed Strip Club, and she'd get this sick feeling in her stomach, and she would get very condemning, very judgmental about the people who are going, the men going in there, especially the girls who are dancing in there, uh, and stripping and stuff, and. They met a, then she was watching Dateline and, uh, they had the stripper who had become Christian and gone back to the club to, to just share the gospel with the girls. And she said suddenly she began to see her sinful attitude towards them and she began sobbing. And, um, so then she met with some other women at her church and they began praying, uh, for these girls and they, they, they prayed for two years. Um, and then uh, Christmas 2008, they prepared some gift baskets, and they were going to drop them off the doors of the, of the nine clubs, and they were going to ask that they, they please give them to the dancers. And uh, they, somewhere they met a former dancer. I didn't say exactly how they got in contact with this woman. She said, you know, if you're going to want to deal with something, you're going to have to go in, sit down, and order something and give them their baskets. And they're like, oh, man, you know, we we, – we, we, you know, I didn't think we'd ever have. She said, I started laughing very hard. I didn't think I would have to go inside, let alone sit there. And that December, we all went, you know, we went into all of them. And they sat down um, and talked and, um, you know, began to develop relationships with them. I just, you know, she said, um, they may think I'm there to condone their lifestyle. But I'm there working at building a relationship so we can move past that. Relationships always precede teaching. I mean, you know, I, you know, I don't do any instructing in the club. I save that for the women I'm beginning to build a relationship with outside the club. Then it comes naturally. This is uncondi- it's unconditional love. We have to love them where they are, but love them too much to leave them there. I mean, I just, this is great stuff. It's like, they get the gospel. Yeah, it just makes you want to cry. You know, and, and this is the whole thing. What I was talking about is, is that, like, I was driving pl- past this club and, and thinking, how do we reach the women that work there? And I can't go in there. I cannot. All right. Even if I went in there with that intent, all right, it would not be proper for me to go in there. All right. It would just, it would, you know, no one would, would take my intention seriously. It would be, um, it would be hurtful to, uh, to my wife and to, to my family. It would be, you know, setting a, a very bad example for my congregation, you know, like, no, you know, the, there's a, there's a reason that the Bible says, uh, you know, that, you know, stand up against all kinds of sin. But when it comes to sexual sin, it says flee from it. Right. But a woman, can go in there. Right. Um, yeah, there was a, uh, you know, there, there, you know, there, there, yeah, there are just some things that are proper and some things that are not. Right. And for a pastor to enter a, 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 a strip club is not it. Uh, but they, you know, it's interesting just that the stuff that they're willing to do for them, um, they, um, um, I mean, and, and I mean, it's just, they're respectful of club personnel. Always ordering food, they tip generously, and they pay the dancers for their time when they want to sit and talk and not perform. I mean, you know, that's that's that is really going an extra mile. I just hope the food's good. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I, and, the, and this is, all right, there's a great expression that I once heard, a couple things that, that immediately come to mind with this. Number one, um, the saying goes, if you want to reach centers, you got to sit in the smoking section. In other words, you got to go places where you're uncomfortable, all right, because if you only ever hang around with people that make you comfortable, then chances are you're not hanging around with people that aren't Christians. And, um, and so that means you got to go places that are just not really your kind of places, mm. right? But otherwise, who's going to reach them? Right. Oh, well, the other thing is that's kind of neat to me about the story is it says, um, you know, known affectionately by dancers, managers, and other club personnel as the church ladies. Now, I think that's interesting, the term affectionately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they know these are a group of women, Christian women. They know they're there to, you know, try to bring the girls out of this, this, this lifestyle. And yet, you know, there's an affection there that they know these, these women are, you know, there to truly love them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Affectionately. It's not, you know, see, you kind of get the impression that when, when these ladies walk in, it's like, Oh, hey, you know, how you doing? As opposed to, Oh man, them again, you know, right. they're not out there picketing and, and all kinds of stuff like that. They're, they're going in there. They're meeting people where they're at. And the other thing that, that really jumped out at me about this is just this whole idea that, um, that, you know, we're not condoning their lifestyle and, and, and we're not trying to, um, we're not, uh, you know, we're, we don't want them to stay there. But at the same time, we're not, um, you know, we're establishing relationships with them first. All right. Right. No. And, you don't get. Um, the, oh, another expression is, um, you can't blame lost people for acting like they're lost. Uh, so right. often, you know, we, we, we expect people to behave, right? And, um, and then when they don't, you know, we, we basically say, no, you gotta learn to behave and then we'll tell you about Jesus. You know, and, and you gotta, if you wanna come to our church, if you want us to, um, if you wanna be in our Bible study group or, or anything like that, then you gotta behave first. Right? Well, why should I? You know? First tell them about Jesus and tell them how great he is, and then let them say, you know what? Um, I don't, Jesus is really great, and, and I want to live for him, and therefore, uh, I need to change some of the things that I do. You know? I mean, you can't, you just, you can't force that on people. Right. But, no, I just thought that was a great story. I really did. I just, I thought that here's the church really being the church in a very good way. I ended up tonight uh, with our last story which was from the Wall Street Journal, and talking tonight, to this this kind of, this story is about the um, about vouchers. Now, vouchers are very um, controversial in some areas, I think, uh, because of uh, it's giving this you know money to the um, uh, taking tax dollars and giving them to 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 people. But this is kind of a neat story. Um, that the, the the use of vouchers in public in in to Catholic schools is helping to bring new life to a lot of these these Catholic schools. Um, they're um, you know they're 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 a lot of these churches are growing. I mean, these schools are growing again because of it. Um, as one uh, woman said, uh, thanks to vouchers. Um, one Catholic church, one Catholic school, not church, one Catholic school, which was $140,000 in debt to the Catholic diocese, uh, picked up 72 new students, boosting enrollment by 38%. And growth is a good problem to have. This is, by the way, the, so yeah, the, the, this is out of various places. This is out of uh, Indiana. Uh, she said, you know, it's, it's a good thing to have, good problem, because it's, you know, and you look at a lot of these, um, you know, you know, especially inner city public school systems, they're not very good, and yet the, for some reason the Catholic schools have been able to do good work there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is this is interesting in light of uh, what we talked about last time about uh, schools using Catholic buildings. 
you know, here you're, you're literally yep. sending kids to Catholic schools. Not that the schools are sending the kids there, but the vouchers make it possible. Um, this, this is kind of a, a home turf thing uh, for us because uh, not for me specifically, but um, Cleveland was the first city to uh, to use vouchers to send kids to uh, or to allow their use in religious schools. So, um, I and I, I have friends uh, that are pastors in Cleveland. Um, that uh, really benefit from the voucher system and and said that it, it really makes a difference because you have families that are just looking for, I mean, Cleveland schools are up to, what, like, I think it's pushing like 40 students per class or something like that. They keep laying off more and more teachers, and it's, it's just really getting um, kind of sad. And, um, and these Christian schools um, are helping out by providing... Um, better student teacher ratios and, um, and things like that. But, you know, it's not just the Catholic schools that are benefiting from this. Um, you know, I know uh, uh, Lutheran schools that it's made a huge difference for them. It's, you know, and, and in fact, they said, I don't know what we do without the voucher system. So, I mean, cause it's Cleveland's not exactly a rich city and, uh, you know, the problem with, religious schools is that most people can't afford to send their kids to one. So, um, you know, it, it makes a difference. It allows people. Now, um, I, I was doing some reading and, um, and I did see that there was a study done that found that, um, test scores, uh, are not better, uh, coming from private schools than public. But I'm a little skeptical because uh, that article was on a um, public board of education uh, sort of <laughs> website. So it's like, well, who funded this study, you know? So, um, you know, but it's, it's a really great opportunity for schools uh, to do outreach uh, or for, you know, for churches to work with schools uh, to do outreach to, um, to teach kids about Jesus to connect with families. Uh, but also it's, it's a real challenge. It's something that, that we're uh, facing as a church that has a fairly large preschool. We generally have about 50 families in our preschool. And, um, and so how do we connect with those families? How do we, you know, yeah, we're, we're telling their kids that Jesus loves them. And, um, and, but how do we, bring the gospel to the families how do how do we take that message and get it home um so that it's more than just something that they're hearing along with learning their abcs so and it's a challenge and in fact um i'm i'm actively researching this right now because um i really looking at least statistically in the past um we haven't done very well with that here uh, our preschool has an excellent reputation uh, but at the same time, um, we as a, as a congregation have, have, a, have had a hard time, um, sort of bridging that gap. And so it's, it's one of the things that I'm, I'm really, um, seeking to figure out how to bridge that gap. And, um, so if any of our uh, listeners and viewers have any suggestions or thoughts, if, if your church has a school, uh, whether it be a, uh, um, a day school or, or a, a preschool or a daycare or anything like that, and, um, and you found certain things to be successful, uh, in helping to bridge that gap and, um, and, you know, establish relationships and things like that, uh, let us know, uh, cause I'd really appreciate it. Leave a comment or, or send a email podcast at crossfeednews.com. Right. I would be interested in what they have to say too. Um, it's interesting too, though. She said that that you know um, that, that talking this article again, uh, Saint Stan's you know had its its issues, and this is um, that they can continue test scores, they can continue other things, you know. But the Saint Stan seems to have a pretty open enrollment policy, and um, says uh, most new students transferred from East Chicago Public Schools, one of the state's lowest performing districts. Some arrived behind academically. Others bristled at the strict uniforms and behavior policies. Um, 
And uh, so, you know, it's, 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 you know, one of the teacher, the fifth grade teacher says it's great for the school, but it's a lot more work. But yet, uh, St. Stan's is rated exemplary by the state for its high test scores. Um, and they've had to tutor and, you know, work real hard to get these kids caught up, but they've done it. And by the way, it's interesting that even though there's this, you know, the, 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 uh, the, Public schools are complaining it's a drain because it's taking money away from them. And, you know, a lot of times it's some of the most engaged. A lot of time, the vouchers are less than what they're, they're paying in the public school system, you know, on a per student basis. Uh, so, you know, it's just stuff. But anyway, it says, uh, one, one girl, uh, she, um, uh, really struggled with the discipline. And uh, so she was passing notes in class a few times, received the detention, which was not just sitting in the classroom. She had to go out and help shovel snow off the, the school sidewalks. And she said, I got mine after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. My problem with the now, it, it, you know, it's interesting. You know, I don't mind so much that this the, 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 the really is a straight voucher program. Okay, so we're going to give the money to the parents. Parents, you can use the school wherever you want. Go, go. You know, we don't care where you send your kid to school. Uh, we're going to we have certain requirements, but other than that, we don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, but sometimes you know when the the problem gets to my mind gets to be. What happens if later on we say, oh, we got some problems. We're going to start cutting off the money. Or if you don't, you know, tow the, lo- the, the following lines that we want to have towed, um, we're going to cut off the money. And now you've got these schools staying open. You've kind of got them addicted to the money coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Now we've we made can, investments you know, for, you know, larger classrooms or, or whatever else that require more upkeep. So, yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I look at it from the perspective that um, any time that you get in bed with the government, you know, you're always taking that risk. You know, whether even if it's just a, a little bit of extra funding or a lot of extra funding, you know, um, whatever it is, any time that you accept money from somebody, you know, they're going to want something in return. And you have to be aware of that. And, and, and I think that, that as a school, as a, as a church, as a, whatever your organization, you need to be aware and, and you need to really say, all right, you know, if we're going to do this, we need to, um, we need to know where we draw the line and, and have that in writing before you go into it or if you're already in it. Um, and you and you don't have something in writing, you really need to sit down and say, "All right, you know, push comes to shove, where do we draw the line and and get it in writing um and and number two, you need to have some sort of an exit strategy so that if things get to the point where we have to draw the line and cannot step over it um and we're being forced to, what do we do and have a plan ready to go in case that happens. It's time we face up to the unface up to a boo. Yep. Um, because I don't trust the government. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you just, you got to be ready for it. Yeah, and that's, and that's yeah. what it comes down to. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it's, uh, it's interesting when I was down in, because um, uh, you're talking preschool, when I was down in Florida, um, they have voluntary pre-kindergarten and you, as long as you meet some minimum requirements, the state will pay for your child to do pre-kindergarten wherever you want the child to go. Uh, so, you know, there's, for your, your preschool, there's, there would be no cost to any parent. Hmm. Um, and then, which is interesting because then, you know, you, you can attract them based on we're Christian versus non-Christian. Or we have better academics than the next place. I mean, you can really focus on your program because, you, you know, everybody's going to get paid for it. It's not going to cost them anything. Yeah. So uh, it's going to be kind of what interests us. Yeah, the interesting program. The government can afford to do that. But yeah. So, well, different states can afford to do different things. It all depends what the state wants to pay for. Right. So, and how much people want to pay tax in taxes. 
Well, if you have any comments on how churches can use schools more effectively or you have uh, comments on this particular little voucher program or anything else, uh, please give us your, con- your, your information. You can contact us at uh, uh, podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yep. If you haven't already, um, you can like us on uh, Facebook. Just uh, just do a search on Crossfeed News or Crossfeed Religious News, and it'll, it'll come up. And uh, but you know, th- yeah, throw us a like, and um, it's a way to get updated. And you can leave comments there. A uh, number of our uh, viewers do it that way. And um, and uh, and I'll I'll encourage you again to uh, also. If you use iTunes to get your podcasts, uh, go and leave a review for us there. Uh, we'd appreciate that. There's, I think one of them has one review or something. We haven't had much in the way of reviews, and one of them's pretty, pretty negative, but it's also really old, uh, from when we first started doing things. And, you know, in six years' time, uh, most of those, uh, complaints don't even apply anymore. So. We've grown up. Jim's gotten older. <laughs> I've gotten a little bit better over the years. Yeah, but uh, and um, hey, if we got Dale off uh, dial up, man. That was that was a miracle in itself. But uh, yeah, yeah, our audio is a whole lot better now too. <laughs> a lot of things are a whole lot better. But hey, those were fun days. Yep, those were fun days. So anyway. God bless you. Take care. Have a great week in the Lord's grace, and we hope to see you next week. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless you.